Ocean Hills at its best is when we are in it together. Not still, but we just started the book of 1 John last week. Thank you to Pastor Jono who launched us into that sermon series. And uh, I got a chance to watch the video. He did a fantastic job of feeding our, uh, our souls last week and uh, bringing the word to us. And uh, so appreciative uh, of him. Let me begin by just reminding us that 1 John, if you're taking notes, think about this. It's, in fact, the scripture's on the back of your program. For those of you that don't know, you can. this is the passage we're going to walk through this morning. Uh, I hesitate to say this because it, it, it infers that we're not, but you know, sometimes people go, is this a biblical church? Yes, we teach the Bible here at Ocean Hills. We don't say that every week, but we are a biblical church. We are uh, centered. We believe that God's word is our authority. And we uh, surrender and submit to it. We believe that Christ is the life giver. And so we do teach God's word every week. This particular sermon series, we're walking through a book of the Bible. First John, over the next several weeks this fall, uh, is our focus. And so here's what I want, kind of an overview. If you, if you want to press a little bit deeper, and some of you do, you come and you go, I want, I want, I want to grow a little bit deeper. I'm going to encourage you to, to, to read the whole book in one setting and look for the contrast. This is a book of contrast, and I jotted down a bunch of them. First John is about light and darkness. John, the writer, he talks about darkness and light. He talks about a new commandment and an old commandment. He talks about loving God and, and loving the world and the difference between the two, about Christ and the Antichrist about truth and deception, love on one hand, hatred on the other. He talks about having and finding life and not having life. And so as you read, you look for these little clues of, wow, this is a book of contrasts. And we live in a world that is full of contrasts. And what John's trying to lay out for us and help us to discover is that the way of Jesus is the way of life. I was preparing this week, and, and the big idea in my mind, in my heart, was this phrase, and I wrote it in my notes. Today I want to talk about the God I wish you knew. The God I wish you knew. And the reason I phrased it that way is because I was thinking, I have, I have a lot of conversations with people especially at weddings I do, they find out I'm a pastor, and it leads to these spiritual conversations. And I get to hear people's perspectives about God and about Jesus. And it feels like a more mainstream view of Jesus. And I wrote down some of them, because I thought if I viewed Jesus the way that much of the people in my world view Jesus, I wouldn't follow him either. Because people in our world they think about Jesus and they think that he's irrelevant, he can't relate to me, he's judgmental, he's critical, he's full of fire and brimstone, he's distant, so he doesn't notice and he doesn't care about my problems. He's not forgiving. He couldn't forgive if, if he really knew what the way I lived and what I said and what I did, he couldn't and wouldn't forgive me. These are the kind of perspectives that, that people out in our community, that they learned those points of views and that perspective from somewhere. But I want you to know they didn't learn it from the Bible because that's not what the Bible teaches about this God. That's why the big idea is this morning, I want to help us discover a God of the Bible. It's the God I, I wish you knew and I hope you know by the time we get to the end of this. 1 John chapter 2 Verses 1 through 14. The God I want you to know. And there's just four reflections I'm going to pull out of the scripture this morning. In Jesus Christ, we have, you have, I have four things. We have a loving advocate. That's my first point. We have a living example to follow. That's my second point. We have a lighted pathway. He lights the path. We don't have to walk in darkness. That's my third point. And my fourth point is a life-giving family. In Jesus, he gives us a family, a second family. And it's a family of life-giving relationships. And so let's just discover these together in the text. Number one, in Jesus, he's a, he's a loving advocate. What does that mean? Look at the text. 
verses 1 through 3. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. He's telling us why he's writing. Why? So that you won't sin. He's saying, I don't want you to sin. What's the next word? But if anybody does sin, there's a little out clause. Are you ready for this? But if you do sin, if anybody does sin, and here's the good news about Jesus. We have an, what's the word? Say it loud. An advocate. You have and I have in Jesus Christ a loving advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He's the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the world. The word advocate in the original language is a defense attorney. Think about that. That's what we have. Jesus is your defense attorney. What's he defending you against or who? Scripture teaches that we have an adversary. The devil is an accuser. That's his role, is to accuse you of your sin, to make you feel guilty. How many of you feel guilty after you sin, but you ask God for, to forgive you, and then you go, I still feel guilty? Am I the only one who's ever had Raise your hand if you've had that experience. That voice is not God's voice. Because you have a loving advocate who has your back. The scripture says that Jesus Christ is a loyal friend. You're not going to find a more loyal friend than Jesus. That's what the New Testament teaches. He has your back. He's your advocate. And even though the devil will accuse you and accuse you and accuse you, the scripture, the truth, the timeless truth of God's word is we have a loving advocate. He's, he's got our back. Let me ask you a question. Is there anything better in life than a friend who has your back, that's loyal, that when others are accusing you, they stand up for you? Is that love or not? Have you experienced that? It's powerful. And what scripture wants you to experience, not just up here, but to really feel and experience in your life, is Jesus Christ is that friend. He's that loving advocate. And it's funny, but in these first three verses of this text, they give us, and I just kind of a sidebar, but they give us really the, the foundation of the Christian faith. I call them the three R's of Christianity. And this is really for those of you who are brand new, who are saying, maybe you were like me. I, I didn't go to church when I was a kid. And so as a teenager, I walked in to a church and I didn't know anything about the Bible, anything about Jesus. And just in these three verses, there's just such a, a great little outline. The three R's of Christianity. The reality, the remedy, and the requirements. What's the reality? Well, verse 1 says that we're sinners. If anybody does sin, and that's everybody, we all sin. The Bible says each of us has a sin disease. We've been inflicted with a sin disease from birth. That's the reality, and that means we're separated from God. We're alienated from God. That's the, re that's the spiritual reality of what's happening according to scripture. The remedy is verse two. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but for the whole world. That includes everybody. That means everybody's life matters to God and that Jesus died for every person on the planet when he died on that cross. He died for our sin, the sin that separates us. He did something about it. He died on the cross to pay the penalty. The reality, the remedy, the requirements is verse 3. So what? When you think of, okay, he died for me, so what? How should I then respond and live? Look at verse 3. What does it say? Verse 3 says this. We know that we have come to know him if what? We keep his commands. If we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. The truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in him, in them. Just gave you just a short little gospel message. The reality, the remedy, the requirements. In Jesus Christ, we have a loving advocate. That's the, the, the truth perspective of who God is. Secondly, we have a living example. Verses four through six. Look at that last part of verse, 
verse 6 there. Whoever claims to live in him must what? Four words. Live as Jesus did. Live. Circle that in your outline if you do that, just in your notes. Live as Jesus did. What does that mean? It means that Jesus is a living example. He's a mentor. He's a model, a role model, an example. He teaches us. He shows us how to live life. Can I tell you that that is a powerful gift to have somebody in your life that shows you and teaches you how to live in a healthy, life-giving way? So many of us didn't grow up with great role models, but Jesus takes the guesswork out of how to live. And I'm going to guess that some of you have never had a really great role model in your life. In an audience this size, some of you came in here today and you're making decisions that are self-destructive, you're walking in darkness, you're, you're, you're messing up your most important relationships because you've never had a mentor, an example, somebody that's kind of ahead of you, a, a dad, a mom, an aunt, an uncle, who was, who was a, a living, great, healthy role model. I've told this story to a few of you, but I've never told it publicly. This past year, I did a, a, a celebrity wedding. I'm not going to tell you who it is, but I did a celebrity wedding. And I went to this guy's room before the wedding. And I was in the room with his roommate, or not his roommates, with his groomsmen. I was, in, I was in his hotel room with his groomsmen. And there was like six or eight of us just hanging out, talking. And uh, it was great. But here's what you need to know. The, the groom did not have one family member, not one, attending his wedding estranged from, every, from his family. Can you imagine getting married and not having, I mean, it's not that all your family's passed away. He's got plenty of family, but not one was invited to the wedding. They weren't, not one was, was going to be at this wedding. First of all, that, wow, that just hurts. That broke my heart when I heard that. So then I'm thinking, okay, this guy, there's some, there's some ouch in his life. He, he needs he needs some people in his life who are going to be examples and role models. So I'm thinking, how cool. The father-in-law. Maybe that's going to be the role model. So I'm sitting there with these guys and we're talking and just hanging out. And the father-in-law, his future father-in-law, comes into the hotel room. And he says to me, Reverend. <laughs> some people call me Reverend. Nobody in this church calls me Reverend. But some people call me Reverend. <clears throat> Reverend. Um, Hey, can you tell me which foot I'm supposed to start with when I walk my daughter down the aisle? And I said to him, I go, hey, with all due respect, you're overthinking this. I said, this is such a powerful moment to savor with your daughter. Be in the moment. Don't overthink, do we start with our left foot or our right foot? And this is what I said. This has the potential to be the best moment or one of the best moments of your entire life. And the, you know, six or eight guys are there in the room and what he said in response to me just, it absolutely broke my heart is what he said. This isn't gonna be the best moment of my life. Best moment of my life was when I was 14 years old. My uncle bought me my first prostitute. That was the best moment of my life. Now you just stop and think about that right there. Now think of the groom, no family in his life. And now he's marrying into a family and this is gonna be the role model, the father-in-law. Jesus Christ is the best role model. We all need him as an example. He's more than just an example. You know that. He's more than a mentor and a role model. He's the savior of the world. He's the Lord, the master of the universe. But he shows us how to live, how to love, how to forgive, how to deal with anger, how to deal with disappointment. Jesus, according to John, as he writes this letter, he shows us how to live. And I just love that. This is the Jesus not the, not the kind of father-in-laws, and maybe some of you have had those, that kind of an example. We learn to live by the people around us. Jesus Christ says, I want to be that example for you. I want to show you how to live. So read the Gospels. Look at who he spent time with. Look at how he treated people. Read the red. Read his words and follow him. 
Third reflection on this text. In Jesus Christ, we also have a lighted pathway, a lighted pathway. He's the light of the world. He shines his light in our darkness, and we need his light. It's really, really frustrating to walk in the dark. And you guys know this. i just tell you a quick story. I was out Friday night, and I got home about midnight, and all the lights in our house were out. And uh, we kind of have this little family agreement that I'm not supposed to wake up my wife when I come home late. Anybody else have that agreement? So I get undressed in the living room. I take out my clothes in the living room, and I go into the bedroom. And I'm tiptoeing. And I can't see, even though I've lived in this house 29 years, you know, it's dark. But I think I know where everything is. And I'm tiptoeing because I don't want to wake up my wife. And I barefooted. I kick the base of the, of the bedpost. Have you ever done that? It's midnight. Boom! And I just can't keep it in me. Ow! Now here's, you know, I'm walking in darkness physically. But then I went to the dark side emotionally. I wanted to blame my wife because she was sleeping. So I was like going to bed going, oh my gosh, you know. And I started in my mind, that's where I was going. Like if she would just let me turn on the light, my foot wouldn't be hurting so bad, blah, blah, blah. My point is we stumble and bumble without light. And sometimes that takes us to dark places. Listen to this, without the light of Jesus... You and I stumble and bumble and fumble. Listen to these verses, verses 7 through 11. Dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old one that you've had since the beginning. The old command is the message you've heard. Listen to this. Yet I am writing you a new command. The truth is seen in him and in you because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light. And there's nothing in them to make them what? Stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in darkness. They do not know where they're going. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. I'm wondering if some of you here feel like that, that you don't know where you're going. You don't know where you're walking. Your life is dark. You're filled with hate. You're filled with resentment. You're filled with anger. Maybe you would say to yourself this morning, I've lost my way. I've lost my way in my career. Some of you might say, I got lost in the moment. I just heard that phrase in a conversation this weekend. A few of us friends had gathered together and, and we talked about, how do you avoid getting lost in the moment? You know what that's like, some of you, when I hear that, you're going, I got lost in the moment this weekend. I made some bad decisions. I'm in the dark when it comes to relationships, parenting, purpose, meaning. I have a question that I want to ask you. I want to ask all of us this morning. Where do we learn how to live life? Where do we learn that? Where did you learn how to live, how to love? Where did you learn how to hate, how to be bitter? Listen to some of these questions. Where did you learn that it's okay to avoid conflict and just give your husband or your wife the silent treatment for weeks and months on end? Who taught you that it's okay to yell and scream, to hold on to bitterness, to bully the people you live with? Who said that? Who taught you that that's okay? We learn these things somewhere from someone. Last weekend, uh, our family was away celebrating our daughter's 21st birthday. And I snuck off to a mega church and uh, heard this pastor's message, and it was really good. But he quoted Father Richard Rohr. And Richard Rohr actually is one of my, uh, I'm not going to say it because I know I always say it, one of my favorite authors, one of my favorite books. But he's, he, he's a, pro, a prolific writer, and I've read many of his books. And that pastor quoted uh, Richard Rohr, and this is such a great quote. If you're taking notes, you're going to want to write this down. Here's what 
Richard Rohr says, if we don't let God transform our pain, we will transfer it on to others. Now just keep that on the screen. If we don't let God transform our pain, there's not a person in this room who has not experienced deep pain in your life from your childhood on some level. The way you handle money, you learn that somewhere, whether to hoard it, whether to spend it all on yourself. Where did you learn that? You learned it from somewhere. The way you treat people, the way you spend your time, every part of your life, some of it you can reach back into your childhood and say, there's a pain there. And what Father Richard Rohr is saying, if we don't let God touch that pain, if we don't open that pain up to God and invite him in and say, touch the ouch, touch the hurt, touch the dysfunction, touch that part of me that's toxic. He says, if you don't let him do that, what will happen? You will, you will transfer that on to your kids, to your employees, to your friendships, to the people in your world. And so the stakes are so high. God wants to heal us. He wants to take our life and he wants to take that pain. He cares about it and he wants to work with us. And healing takes time. I'm learning that with my back from my injury. But to take that and, and open your life and say, God, would you transform my life and the pain in my life so I don't transfer it onto my kids? Psalm 32.8. The Lord says, I'll guide you along the best pathway for your life. The best pathway for your life. That's a verse to, to memorize, to underline, to circle, to highlight. See, Jesus invites us to live in the light, not in the darkness. To live a life of love, not indifference or hate. To forgive rather than be bitter. To share, not steal. To build others up rather than to tear others down. To trust him rather than think we know what's best. He says, no, the Lord says, I know the best way, the best pathway for your life. And it's a lighted pathway because he's the light of the world. Let me close with the fourth reflection. In Jesus Christ, we have a life-giving family. If you look at the verses 12 through the end of the passage, it's really interesting. Dear children, fathers, young men, children, fathers, young men, it's repeated. It's repeated. And you know, N.T. Wright makes a comment about this. It's a sidebar here. He says... One of the things you discover about John, he goes, it reminds me of, of singing in church. He said, the way John writes is much more like singing praise choruses. John repeats himself over and over again. He says, hymns tell a story. And he goes, and a lot of the biblical writers write like hymns. But he says, John writes like praise choruses. And some of you are going, why do we keep singing the same words over and over again? That's John. We get that from John. We also get that from the Psalms, David. There, there are recurring themes that there's a reason they repeat them over and over and over and over again. And I know some of you go, I get tired of that. You know what? God's saying, I want this truth to sink into you. And so as you look at verses 12 through 14, he repeats himself. He's talking to the dear children, to fathers, to young men. Why does he have to do that all over again? But he does in verse 14, I write to you, dear children, I write to you, fathers, I write to you, young men. This is his writing style. But here's the insight that I want to pull from that. It's that God gives us a life-giving family in Jesus Christ. You're born into, adopted into, once you're born again, you're adopted into his family. That language is family language, fathers, young men, children. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 12. While Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside wanting to speak to him. And someone told him, your mother and brothers, they're standing outside. They want to speak to you. Notice his reply. He replied to them, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And then pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Notice that John in this chapter says that the family of God, the family of God, 
that we're all at different stages of spiritual development. Some of us are little children. We're newer in the faith. Some of us were along a little bit further. We're more like teenagers spiritually in the faith. Our development, our spiritual development, we're like the young men and young women. But then others of us are more mature. We've been around longer. We have more experience. We've been walking with God more and longer. We're spiritual fathers, spiritual mothers, according to John. And it is so powerful to see little children grow up in the faith and become young men and young women. And then become spiritual fathers and mothers. And it doesn't have to do with age, by the way. It can, but it doesn't have to. Some of you are in your 50s, 60s, and you're little children in the faith, and that's fine. But what I want you to hear is that as a church, we are a church that understands and embraces this. And we long to see more and more of you become spiritual fathers and mothers to people in this church willing to disciple and mentor, to come alongside and, and just, you know, have those kind of conversations, spiritual conversations that matter, talking about real life that matters. I'll close with this story. Last night, I was at a friend's birthday party, and it was really fun and good food, and um, there was a moment, everybody was kind of over here, and I happened to be over here on a couch by myself, watching the Giants playoff game. I, I kind of hate to admit it, but I, I wasn't with everybody in the party. I just kind of sitting over here. And a little boy, the son of the guy who was having the birthday party, he, he just sat down and he said, can we talk? And uh, it led to, this is what he said. He goes, you know, I was, at, I was at Mount Hermon this summer. And I think God wants me to become a pastor. And I wanted to talk to you about it. And so, you know, the game's on here. And he's sitting here. This is a true story. So I said, tell me more. Tell me more. He gets up. He walks over to the TV and he turns it off. <laughs> he comes back and he sits down. And I say, hey, we could just leave it on mute. <laughs> Just leave it on mute. And he goes, he says, no, it's too much of a distraction. I said, well, tell me more. And he says, you know, and he started to tell me about his walk with God. And he said, I think God wants me to help everybody know that everybody is loved by God. And then he said this, man, this is like graduate school. He said, ever since that time at Mount Hermon, he said, my prayer life has changed. He said, I used to pray from my mind, and now I pray from my spirit. You think about that. Ten-year-old boy in our church. Who's going to mentor him? This is a kid leaning in, hearing from God, maybe, maybe this life of ministry. Are we just going to go, well, I hope it, hope it works out for you. God bless you. Let's get that game back on. Right? That's just one. There are people in this audience that are saying, I want more. I want to hear from God more. I want to follow Christ more, but I don't know how to do it. Or I need help. I need somebody to help me take my next step. And I'm telling you from, from my heart, we, I can't disciple and mentor everybody. I'm not even going to try. But this church is only going to get stronger when we have more people that say, I, sign me up. A kid like that, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm willing if, if God, if, if, I'll, I'll mentor that kid. I'll come alongside that kid. You know, John, will you help me mentor that? Yes, I will. If anybody says, help me know how to disciple and mentor, I'll help you do that. But that conversation last night, I'm not kidding, man. That just touched me so deeply. I laid in bed last night going, we have a responsibility as a church to invest, to pour into people and to our kids who are leaning in saying, God's calling me. I want to follow him. Is that you? I'm over time. Let's close in prayer. Let me ask you to reflect on a couple questions with your heads bowed, your eyes closed. Take a moment. First question. It's the foundational one. Have you opened your life to Jesus Christ yet? Do you know him to be that advocate for you? Have you experienced his forgiveness? 
Has He become your loyal friend? And if not, what's holding you back? Is it your misperception? The Bible says He is full of unfailing love. Unfailing love. That He's our advocate. Is today the day that you might say yes to God? To move out of stumbling through the darkness, stubbing your toe at work, in relationships, getting in your own way. Maybe today's the day that you would say, yeah, I've been walking in the dark. Jesus, I want you to be my light. I want you to lead me down the best pathway for my life. Maybe today Psalm 32.8 becomes your life verse. That you trust Christ for the first time and you say, I want that verse to be real for me. For some of you, you don't have that role model, that example. And maybe today's the day you're ready to, to embrace Jesus Christ as the number one example to follow from now on. And my question is, are you willing to step out and to tell him that? Just in, right in the quietness of your heart, say, God, I want to follow you. And then lastly, there are some of you there is a call on your life, and maybe today you're realizing it, to be a spiritual father or a spiritual mother or uncle or aunt to somebody else in this church, to walk alongside them, to, to sit down and have a coffee with them once a week or take them for a walk on the beach and just check in and ask them about how they're doing spiritually and how they're doing at school or how they're doing in their most important relationships. And how they're doing at following Jesus. We need more of you to step up. Is today the day that maybe you'll write on your card, hey, I'm ready to be a mentor. I'm ready to disciple the next generation in this church. You can count on me. Let us know that. Father, I pray for the person here this morning that has not started a relationship with you. I pray that right now in this moment, in this place, that they would simply pray these words. Jesus, I open my heart to you. Come into my life and lead me down the best pathway for my life. I trust you. Be my loving advocate. Forgive me of all my sins. And thank you. Thank you for the good news that you are the light of the world, that I don't have to walk in darkness anymore, but I can have the light of life guiding and directing my life. Oh God, hear the cry of the hearts this morning that are saying yes to you in that way. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can turn